ओम नमो भगवते श्री वासुदेवाय दिस इज द सेकंड सत्संग इन अ सीरीज ऑफ सत्संग्स ऑन द डिवाइन मदर एंड द योगा ऑफ श्री अरविंदो येस्टरडे आई टॉक अबाउट द मदर मीरा अल्फासा एंड हर कमिंग टुगेदर विद श्री अरविंदो and this afternoon i gave a workshop that continued from there and spoke about how the yoga that sri aurobindo was follow, following at that time was modified by the mother's coming and i will continue from that point because i spoke about the contribution of the mother to sri aurobindo's yoga yesterday uh one of the items that we discussed today afternoon as well is the notion of the super mind and sri aurobindo uses the term vigyana from the taittiriya upanishad to translate in english as super mind so since there is a little confusion and there is bound to be confusion because it is not something that is experienceable easily uh i will talk about a few images or uh, of or related to the super mind that come to us from the past as well as from the teachings of sri aurobindo and others before him one such image comes to us from the gita and it is the idea or image of the vishwarupa the vishwarupa darshan that arjuna is gifted to a uh, witness by shri krishna is a paradoxical darshan it's a darshan that goes entirely beyond our capacity to witness given our instruments because unlike a certain kind of an experience where we lose ourselves entirely in an ocean all the rivers lose their names and forms and disappear into the ocean or all the paths go to a mountain top and disappear their names and forms disappear what we find in the vishwarupa is a form that includes all forms it is a being in whom all the beings of past present and future are present it is formless and having form at the same time so this deep paradox tears at the mind of arjuna he cannot stand it and he says please revert back to your cosmic form with four arms because this what gift that was bestowed to arjuna goes beyond the capacity of mental acceptance uh, so this is one image it is interesting that it occurs in the bhagavad gita which is a text talking about an event at the transition between two ages or yugas the treta yuga and the uh, sorry the dwapar yuga and the kali yuga and we find ourselves at another transition right now the transition from the kali yuga to the krita yuga which is a higher higher circle of the spiral that we are moving into today uh, according to shri aurobindo so one may say from a esoteric point of view the vishwarup darshan is a a kind of a a harbinger a a prevision of the evolution that is to come beyond the human given at the end of the earlier age the only person to withstand it is the pioneer of the age uh, arjuna who is as it were given a certain glimpse so that he may absorb it and prepare the human consciousness for the coming of its own evolution uh the second image that i would like to present comes to us from shri ramakrishna this use of the term vigyana that shri aurobindo 
uses and translates as uh, supermind was begun in our times by Sri Ramakrishna, uh, who Sri Aurobindo also adulated and adored as one of his teachers. And Ramakrishna gives a number of parables relating to this term Vigyana. And he uses this term, he clarifies the difference between Jnana and Vigyana and actually points to the fact of the Gita 7th chapter, which is called Jnana Vigyana Yoga. And this chapter is making the distinction, as he points out, and Sri Aurobindo also in his essays on the Gita discusses this particular aspect of the distinction between Jnana and Vigyana in the same way. Jnana is essential knowledge. Jnana is Brahman's knowledge of itself. All things, everything, there is only one reality, that is Brahman. Brahman knows itself by inner self-evidence, and that kind of knowledge is Jnana. We may compare it to our knowledge of ourselves. How do you know that you exist? If somebody was to ask you, how do you know that you exist? You cannot answer that question because it is not through description that you know that you exist. You know that you exist by essential identity. This is jnana. Brahman's self-knowledge is jnana, known by identity and beyond any ability to describe or any instrument of knowing. However, Brahman has become everything in this world. So this vishesha jnana, this specialized knowledge of how it becomes all the things of the cosmos is vijnana. So Ramakrishna would say, having jnana and vijnana together is the true siddhi of jnana. And that is how he points out uh, the idea of Vigyana as the goal of what he called his sadhana as well. One of the parables he gives to describe Vigyana is the parable of the dyer, the dyer, the man who dyes cloth. And so he would say that there is a magical dye, so an alchemist who uses a dye that has the property of dyeing any cloth the color you want it. So he used to set up shop, people would come through the day and he would ask, what color do you want your cloth? He would say yellow and he'd just dip it in and it would come out yellow. The next person's green, it would come out green. So one man was watching this throughout the day and he came back at the end of the day with a cloth and the dyer asked, what, cloth do you, what color do you want your cloth? He said, no, no, I wanted the color that's in the dye. So this color that's in the dye is a parable of the supermind. It, it can express itself as infinite colors, any color that we may want to see it as, but it is actually all those colors at once. To experience this, one cannot use the mind. The mind sees only the distinct colors. That's the law of the excluded middle. You need one thing or another. But to know it as that which carries the infinity of colors in itself and knows itself at once to be the infinite colors is the vijnana, according to Ramakrishna. Uh, the third uh, approach to vijnana is uh, that I want to uh, introduce is an early letter of Sri Aurobindo to his brother, who was also a revolutionary by the name Barin. A uh, little after he came to Pondicherry, Sri Aurobindo moved to Pondicherry, and before the mother came, uh, he wrote this letter to his brother, who wanted to know what is the root principle of his yoga. The brother had been sent to the Andamans. He was first. Uh, to be hanged uh, for his activities. Uh, and then he was sent to a jail in the islands. And when he came out, Sri Aurobindo was in Pondicherry. So he asked him, I want to follow your sadhana. What is the nature of your sadhana? 
So Sri Aurobindo writes, the root principle of my yoga is to make a harmony and unity of complete knowledge, complete works, and complete bhakti. To raise all this above the mind and give it its complete perfection on the supramental level of vijnana. And he also uses the term gnosis sometimes for this. The mind can grasp only the divided and partial. It cannot wholly seize the infinite and indivisible. One man or another may indeed attain a featureless moksha, but what is the gain? The Brahman, the Self, God are ever present. What God wants in man is to embody himself here in the individual and in the community to realize God in life. The old way of yoga failed to bring about the harmony or unity of spirit and life. It instead dismissed the world as maya or a transient play. We must first attain all the partial experiences possible on the mental level and flood the mind with spiritual delight and illumine it with spiritual light. But afterwards, we must rise above. If we cannot rise above to the supramental level, that is, it is, uh, that is, it is hardly possible to know the world's final secret and the problem it raises remains unsolved. There, the ignorance which creates a duality of opposition between the spirit and matter, between truth of spirit and truth of life, disappears. There, one need no longer call the world Maya. The world is the eternal play of God, the eternal manifestation of the self. Then it becomes possible to fully know and re fully realize God, to do what it is said in the Gita to know me integrally. The physical body, the life, the mind and understanding, the supermind and ananda, these are the spirit's five levels. These are the Taittiriya Upanishad's levels, annam, pranam, mana, vijnana and, and ananda. Mm -hmm. The higher, ma higher man rises on this ascent, the nearer he comes to the state of that highest perfection open to his spiritual evolution. Rising to the supermind, it becomes easy to rise to the ananda. One attains a firm foundation in the condition of the indivisible and infinite ananda in the body, in life, in the world. The integral being, the integral consciousness, the integral ananda blossoms out and takes form in life. This is the central clue to my yoga, its fundamental principle. So I wanted to continue from last time to talk about the cosmology of Sri Aurobindo. We spoke about how when the mother came, she brought certain new ideas, the idea of the psychic being and the idea of preparing the lower planes of consciousness. We talked about the Taittiriya Upanishad's five layers and also about the division between knowledge and ignorance of Vidya and Avidya in the Upanishads. Vidya is normally taken to be the three planes of Sat, Chit, and Ananda. But as Sri Aurobindo will point out, Vijnana is the fourth step of the Vidya. It is also the fourth step of the Avidya. The four, Sat, Chit, Ananda, and Vijnana, constitute what he calls Chatushpad Brahman. Brahman with four feet, the cow of the Vedas that has four feet. These are the four feet, Sat, Chit, Ananda, and Vijnana. Inverted, these are the four feet that we experience. We experience three of them, matter, life, and mind, Annam, Prana, and Mana. But the fourth foot is Vijnana. So Vijnana is the link principle between Vidya and Avidya. So here in this image, we may see that the first horizontal plane is uh, existence, consciousness, bliss, sat, chit, and ananda. 
The next one is supermind, known in the Veda as Mahas and in, in the Upanishad as Vigyana. So between them, they constitute the Vidya consciousness. Below that, you have mind, manas, vital, prana, and physical annam. These three together constitute what we know as avidya, that is the, the experience that we are having right now. Um, now, this is the. There are two two descriptions of this cosmology. One is an actual cosmology. This is what I just described. It's a vertical ladder, a ladder of existence that goes from matter to pure existence, Brahman as Sat. On the other hand, there is a psychology, which is a concentric psychology. That is an inner and an outer part of our experience. So if we look over here at the three lower levels of Annam, Prana, and Mana, we find that it extends to this larger horizontal layer. And there you find that um, you have on the absolute outside what we normally experience. That is a surface mind, a surface vital, and a surface physical bundled and known as myself. That is nothing but my ego. So the ego is a surface formation that bundles together an amalgam of mental, vital, and physical functioning. Behind this surface self is an inner being, the subtle or sukshma sharira, in which there is a subtle a prana, mana uh, existence. And as he points out over here, the surface physical has an inner physical, the surface vital has an inner vital that also is divided by vital. He's again, the Sanskrit term is prana, the pranamaya sharira is divided into three the lower vital, the middle vital, and the higher vital. And the mind, the mana, is divided again into an inner mind with an inner expressive mind, a dynamic mind, and an illumined mind. Now, behind this, at the center of this inner being, is the system of chakras. So we find the chakras. And yesterday I read one of Mother's prayers where she talks about the entire hierarchy of chakras and rising above the mind to a solar level. And that actually gives us the understanding of the tantric chakras in relation to Sri Aurobindo's psychology and cosmology. The Mula Dhara at the level of the physical. At the level of the prana are three chakras, Swadishthana, Manipura, and Anahata. And at the level of the mind, mana, are three chakras, Vishuddhi, Agnya and Sahasrara. So this Sahasrara chakra, the thousand petaled lotus, which is above the head, is the gateway to something even beyond, to the supermind. So when the mother was talking about her experience and of experiencing her mental level as a moon and a further very high up a sun with multicolored rays that was coming down, She's talking about opening the door from the Sahasrara and going up to the supermind. That forms the vertical ladder that she's trying to establish in that particular experience. Um, so this is the inner being. And behind these chakras, up to these chakras, right here, this, this entire system, is what we normally call the division of the nature of prakriti and the purusha or the being that, the true being, the being that stands within. Normally in Patanjali yoga, when they use the term purusha, they mean the mental purusha, the witness self. But in the Vedantic use, there is also a purusha of the life being. Prana Purusha, the, the Pranamaya Purusha, and a Purusha in the body, the Annamaya Purusha. 
So we find behind the prakritic system a physical purusha, annamaya purusha, a pranamaya purusha, and a manomaya purusha. Behind all of these is the antaratman or the soul that has entered inside. And that is what is described in the Katha Upanishad as the being no larger than a thumb residing in the cave of the heart. That the mother from her lineage called the psychic entity. All things have a psychic entity. Anything, even the atom has a psychic entity. The psychic entity develops a certain kind of personality, a soul personality, which Sri the mother and Sri Aurobindo called psychic being. As a personality, it has a mentality of vitality and a physicality. In other words, there is a mind of soul, a, a, a life body of soul, and a physical substance of soul. It is because of this that the psychic being can actually have an effect through the three purushas on transforming our nature into a psychic nature. This is the first real step of the transformation that became the big change, one of the big changes after the mother came, pointing to the fact that the psychic being has to come to the front and transform the matter, life, and mind of the nature and become the agent that will now call down the soup mind to transform the nature. So this is known as psychic transformation, contacting the psychic being, bringing the psychic being to the front as the leader of the mind, vital and physical, and the surrender to the divine mother to prepare the nature. By, by its very nature, the psychic being is surrendered to the divine. It is its very quality to be utterly surrendered to the Ishwara Shakti combination. The, the Purusha Prakriti division is in the Avidya mirroring the Ishwara Shakti combination in the Vidya. And that is what the psychic being is calling down constantly. It is surrendered to that and calling that down. So this is one part of the yoga, the first section of the most important section of the yoga is how to bring that psychic being in front, make it the leader of our lives, and lead a surrendered life that is constantly calling on the divine Ishwara and Shakti. Along with this, there is a spiritual transformation, which is making the mind receptive to the influences from the cosmic mind planes. Now, this is where we come to what I discussed yesterday about Sri Aurobindo's experience in the jail when Vivekananda showed him the future evolution of the mind. If we look at this chart, we find the mind plane is where our mind, what we call the human mind, rational mind, stops at a certain point. But this is the reason why the tantric system sees the, the thousand petal lotus as outside the human mind. It is above the head. And that's where the mind begins to become cosmic. It is no longer your mind and my mind. It is the universal mind. And so we find that what Vivekananda was pointing out, that in this very higher cosmic mind level, there are ranges, and that humanity is reaching a point in its evolution where it must reside in those planes. It must rise out of its entrapment in the human mind and take its normal station in the higher ranges of cosmic mind and gradually make those <clears throat> normal to our existence. For that, you have a number of layers, and that's why he named them higher mind, illumined mind, intuition, and over mind, 
which is really the highest plane of mind, cosmic mind consciousness. And this is what is related to what the Upanishad calls the golden lid in the Isha Upanishad. <clears throat> Above that is the super mind. So making the mind receptive to the influences from there <clears throat> and gradually rising to that plane, as we become more quiet, the mind becomes like a receptive channel that is receiving the intuitions from above. As that happens to a greater and greater extent, we start having experiences where the mental being rises out of the mind and we sense ourselves thinking from above the head. This is actually taking residence in the thousand petal lotus, in the Sahasrara. Gradually, that has to become the, the, the state which then normalizes even higher ranges of cosmic mind. That is the second or spiritual transformation. Using the cosmic consciousness to transform our mind, vital and physical. And then that these two, once complete, then only the third step can be taken, which is the invoking of the supramental shakti to raise the mental consciousness beyond cosmic mind to supermind and use the supramental consciousness to transform mind, vital, and physical. So Sri Aurobindo in his own life, as we'll see tomorrow, in 1926, experienced this second stage. And he was on the way to the third stage when he left his body in 1950. So the mother continued from that point and also was in the, in the state of trying to bring that consciousness down to transform particularly her physical consciousness. That was the last work that she was doing before she passed away. Uh, this is, uh, of course, this is a cover of my book on the system that Sri Aurobindo developed, uh, which he called Sapta Chatushtaya, or the seven quartets of yoga that he received as a program for sadhana in the Alipur jail, when he was in the jail. Uh, and he claims, he says, Sri Krishna gave him this method. Uh, this method has got seven limbs. And what I'm talking about today is really about how it is organized and the organization of this plane and how it gets in a way today morning, I spoke about how it gets modified after the mother came. And I'll just touch on that, but I'll touch on the organization today. Um, as you see that these, these round flower-like uh, elements with four petals are each of them one of the limbs of these seven quartets. And so there are six, I'm using Sri Aurobindo's symbol to describe them. And right at the heart is the seventh, which is the central quartet called Siddhi Chatushtaya or Yoga Chatushtaya, the quartet of yoga, the quartet of the integral yoga. And the other six are arranged around it. So we'll see how that is done in a moment. But yesterday I spoke about the symbol of Sri Aurobindo. It's a very significant symbol because this is what brought Mother and Sri Aurobindo together. She sent this symbol, which was being used on the cover of the journal that was being produced by the Cosmic Movement, to Sri Aurobindo through her then husband, Paul Richard, and asked for an explanation and said that there will be a yogi you will find who will be able to explain this. As I said, Sri Aurobindo was using a very similar kind of symbol for his journal called Dharma, which he was publishing in Calcutta uh, during the nationalist period, just before he came to Pondicherry. And he explained the symbol. What was the explanation he gave? Normally, the, as a tantric symbol, this is considered to be 
the union of the male and the female. The descending triangle is considered the yoni trikona, and the ascending triangle is the purusha trikona. And when they meet together, you have the union of opposites and the bindu at the center, which is the point of creativity. It's like the seed of the new creation. Now, Sri Aurobindo gave a slightly different explanation. He said that the descending triangle is the vidya consciousness, the consciousness of knowledge consisting of sat, chit, ananda. So the three lines of the triangle are sat, chit, and ananda descending to spiritualize the avidya. And the ascending triangle is the avidya consisting of the three principles of matter, life, and mind, annam, prana, and mana, ascending to give form to spirit. So this, is, this symbol is a dynamic evolutionary image or diagram. It is constantly going on. It's going on in the cosmos and it's going on in our lives. Constantly, there is a descent of Satchitananda and an ascent of matter, life, and mind to bring about greater divinization in the evolutionary movement of the earth. So in the life divine, Sri Aurobindo uh, speaks of this in a slightly different way. This is the quotation from the life divine. In a sense, the whole of creation may be said to be a movement between two involutions, spirit in which all is involved and out of which all evolves downward to the other pole of matter. Matter in which also all is involved and out of which all evolves upward to the other pole of spirit. So these are the two evolutions from the two involutions that constitute the overall evolution of cosmos. So to look at the system, we find that the system of seven has a vertical line that has three of these seven contained in them. He calls them, he, he organizes them in the beginning of his diary. He has the chart of these seven and he organizes them according to three in a vertical line that are called the general siddhis. And the other four, he calls them the Adhara Siddhis. They are more like the special or specialized Siddhis. Now, the general Siddhis are the Brahma Chatushta or the quartet of Brahman, the Yoga Chatushta, which I pointed out, or Siddhi Chatushta, which is at the very center, the quartet of Yoga, of the integral Yoga, that really is the uh, the center of the entire system and the quartet of karma or action, which is the third pole of that vertical pole. This is what led me to say yesterday that the system of Sri Aurobindo that he received is a crystallization of one shloka from the Gita the shloka that goes Brahmarpanam, Brahmahave, Brahmagno, Brahmanahutam, Brahmaivatena Gantavyam, Brahma Karma Samadhina. So, this vertical plane with Brahma on the top and Karma on the bottom united through yoga, this is the Samadhi of Brahma and Karma, forms the general Siddhi of Brahma Karma Samadhi. Brahma Karma Samadhi means that identification of Brahman is total so that Brahman is the one who acts in and as us. Brahman is the actor in the world. To achieve this, he talked about the Adhara Siddhis, which are on the four on two sides of these two higher poles. So Brahma 
a Brahman, the quartet of Brahman is surrounded by Shanti or Samata Chatushtaya, the quartet of equality, of peace or equality on the one side, and Vijnana Chatushtaya. Remember that Vijnana is a term for the supermind, but the quartet of knowledge or supermind on the other side. Similarly, the Karma Chatushta, the quartet of action, is flanked on two sides by the quartet of Shakti or power, or what I discussed today afternoon as the quartet of the Divine Mother. And on the other side, by the quartet of the body, Sharira Chatushta. So for works, Shakti and Sharira are the two most important elements or limbs. And for the realization of Brahman, Shanti or peace and knowledge, Vijnana, are the two most important aspects or limbs. We may see in fulfillment of what I called this talk, the union of Vedanta and Tantra, that this hemisphere over here is the hemisphere of Vedanta. The realization of Brahman, along with the realization of Samatha and Vijnana, gives us the higher knowledge, the one oneness with Brahman. And the expressive pole is the pole of Tantra, where we find action proceeding through the realization of Shakti and Sharira, the body and uh, the power, the Shakti. Mm -hmm. So this is how we see that the quartets of Brahman, Karma and Shanti constitute the three uh, limbs of Vedantic realization and the quartets of um, sorry, uh, actually of karma goes down here, of, of karma, sharira and shakti constitutes the pole of the tantric realization. Now, uh, I'm trying to uh, name the, uh, to talk about the various components of each of these um, chatushtayas. <clears throat> So we find that right in the center, this one is the Siddhi Chatushta or the quartet of yoga or Siddhi, the central one. And inside each of these, we have four realizations, four Siddhis. So the four Siddhis of the Siddhi Chatushta, Yoga Chatushta are purification, liberation, enjoyment, and perfection. Should the Mukti, Bhukti, and Siddhi. These four will form the four limbs of the Siddhi Chatushta. Now I want to point out, as I talk about the others as well, that each of these is broken into four, of which two form a Vedantic duet and two form a Tantric duet. That's how we see here Shuddhi and Bhukti belong to the Vedantic means and realization, while bhukti and siddhi belong to the tantric, enjoyment and perfection belong to the tantric side of the, of the yoga. Similarly, when we go up to Brahma Chatushtaya, we find that the four aspects to be realized of Brahman are in fact sat, those four, the Chatushpad Brahman, sat, Chit, Ananda, and Vijnana, and they are named by him. Sarvam is omnipresence, that which is everywhere, which is Sat. Anantam, which is the infinite potency of the divine consciousness, Chit. Jnanam, or omniscience, which is the power of Vijnana in this case, and Anandam which is bliss or delight, the delight of Brahman, Anandam Brahma. So here we may say that Sarvam and Anantam Sat Chit and Anand are the Vedantic pole of this, while 
anandam and gyanam or vigyanam constitute the tantric pole of this karma chatushta the perfection of action here it's very interesting the the four aspects that he gives us in his own diaries krishna kali karma and kama so krishna and kali become the two ishvara and shakti pair of his sadhana his entire sadhana revolves around these two krishna and kali krishna is parameshwara now in the synthesis of yoga when he discusses the yoga of works he gives other names to this but you can recognize it by the name there is a chapter called the master of the works the master of the works is krishna in his diaries itself he often refers to krishna as the master of yoga or the master of works so this is the master of the works is krishna and kali he refers to there is another chapter in the book called the divine will kali is the divine will so as we discussed yesterday Sri Aurobindo's yoga began with wanting to find direct access to the divine will. How can we get the leading or the the adesha of what is to be done here and now? Is it something that is just mentally thought out, or is there something to be done here and now that the divine wills? That is the question. In the Gita. the term that is used is karyam karma this is the central idea of the gita as well this is the question that everything in the gita revolves around arjuna is asking krishna what is the work to be done what is karyam karma what is the divine will and the whole yoga that krishna gives him is to prepare himself to know the divine will so that is kali according to sri aurobindo over here and karma is the work that proceeds and kama is the enjoyment of the work what is the enjoyment of the work work is its own enjoyment there is no fruit the fruit is surrendered to the lord but the work is enjoyment itself and in the work the lord and and krishna and kali are in embrace it is your work is the embrace of krishna and kali and that is the kama that is the joy bliss of the karma chatushta uh to the left we find shanti chatushta the perfection of equality there again we find equality starts with samata which is again straight out of the gita samatvam yoga uchyate yoga is known as samata equality in all things we have to maintain perfect balance perfect equality sri aurobindo says once that becomes stable one starts experiencing shanti that is a peace that nothing can disturb between samata and shanti there is a little difference shanti is an active state it has a quality to it samata is a neutral state it is a quietism as samata becomes more and more settled you start experiencing the bliss of peace you feel peaceful that is a kind of quality a, bi- a bliss as that increases that becomes even more qualitatively full of joy and you experience sukham that is a kind of happiness the happiness of peace and even at a further pitch of that it becomes hasyam which is laughter it's a kind of divine ecstasy that is experienced at all times in all things and these four again you can see samata and shanti being the vedantic uh, realizations and sukham and hasyam being the tantric realizations finally we have uh, or rather uh, connected with the brahma chatushta 
we have the vigyana chatushta the perfection of knowledge and that uh, has four limbs i will not go into depth over there because that will take a lot of time but they are gyana or knowledge trikal drishti or the knowledge of the three times this is in the synthesis of, of yoga the last chapter towards the supramental time knowledge with which he ends ashta siddhi which is similar to the sankhya idea of the eight siddhis and samadhi in his case the idea of samadhi as we saw with the term brahma karma samadhi is not a samadhi in which one loses consciousness in a turiya condition it is a condition of wakefulness in which one is active in the world a kind of jagrat samadhi which is rising higher and higher so he is looking really at if you look at the mandukya upanishad you have four samadhis jagrat swapna shushupti and turiya the shushupti samadhi for shri arubindo is the super mind it is to be experienced in one's waking condition the turiya samadhi is also there and it represents the infinity of what is yet to be manifest there is always infinite more to be manifest even the super mind is just a stage beyond that there is infinity so to arrive at that kind of level of samadhi is what he is talking about here uh below we have the perfection of power which is what i discussed today um uh, virya shakti chandi bhava and shraddha and we discussed at length virya which has to do with the divine mother and her four aspects um and so i will not go into that now tomorrow afternoon for whoever is willing uh i will be discussing the second aspect of shakti um and we also touched on chandi bhava and shraddha uh sharira chatushta the perfection of the body uh, also related to karma arogya of freedom from disease and ultimately physical immortality which is also considered to be part of the supramental realization uthapana which literally means levitation but it is a kind of anti gravitational force to make the body light and ultimately have the capacity to levitate saundarya or beauty which is to manifest the soul quality of beauty so the physical substance is pliable and completely receptive to the expressive qualities of the soul and vividananda which are a number of kinds of ananda or bliss that run through the body so five kinds of ananda are described by shri aurobindo as far as this this is concerned and of course in a predominant way these are tantric uh, siddhis but here too one may consider a break up of the first two as a little more vedantic and the last two as a little more tantric um the goals of vedanta therefore shuddhi mukti shanti vigyana and brahman uh purification liberation peace knowledge and being and the goals of tantra siddhi shakti karma and sharira a divine perfection a bhukti a enjoyment power action and physical immortality so these constitute the way in which the vedantic and tantric goals are brought together what i uh, talked about is that this kind of vertical axis has the yoga chatushta at the center but after the mother came there is a little change of balance that takes place to the system and it is the shakti chatushta that comes right to the center and that is what 
results in the production of the text that you, many of you know called the mother, which becomes the center of the yoga after the, uh, particularly after 1926, when Sri Aurobindo had a certain siddhi, the siddhi of the overmind, the second stage of the three transformations. I think I will stop here and open myself to any questions or comments that you might have. Um, uh, Devashish, you mentioned something about the, the Kali Yuga, according to Sri Aurobindo, somehow about to transition to another era. Can you explain about that? Yes. So, as we know that the, the cycles of the yugas move from uh, Satya Yuga to Treta Yuga, Dwapar Yuga, and Kali Yuga. So, in a certain understanding, that this, this, these cycles are like a spiral. So, the Satya Yuga, Sri Aurobindo in, in a text called The Human Cycle, uh, talks about this, that in a way, Satya Yuga is a perfect age, but he calls it the symbolic age. By symbolic age, it, he means that everything is perfectly working out its own symbolic truth. Everything in the world is a symbol, and it is perfectly working out its own symbol without self-knowledge. So this, we in a way, we come back in a kind of a metaphorical sense to the idea of the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden is a Satya Yuga. Everything carries out in its own perfection without knowing that it is perfect. It, there's no self-knowledge there, but there is a gradual fall that takes place. That's the idea of the Yugas as a fall. So the next fall, to the Treta Yuga, a little bit of that perfect manifestation of the symbol is diminished. And instead, a little bit of ego enters, a little bit of individuality enters. As soon as individuality enters, you have choice. Choice complicates the notion of the divine will. We were talking about the divine will. We don't know what the divine will is because our mental choice is standing in the way. So as soon as choice comes to complicate the perfect will of the symbol, you have on the one hand individual, something individual. On the other hand, something which is perfect that is trying to manifest. You have a next fall to the Dwapar Yuga, more individuality and less of the truth that was manifesting perfectly and spontaneously. And that's why in the Mahabharata, you find such a tremendous chaos is taking place. All the dharmas are breaking down. That's the real central idea in the Mahabharata. It's the transition from the Dwapar Yuga to the Kali Yuga, and all the dharmas are breaking up. So this is why it is a dharma yuddha, you know, dharma kshetra, Kurukshetra. So once the dharmas are breaking up, what takes its place? Pure individuality takes its place. Individuality, we can see it as something very bad because it's all ego, but we can also see it as a glass, you know, upside down. If you look at it, you know, half full glass or, you know, a half empty glass, because we have choice now. And so it is like that metaphor of the return to the Garden of Eden at a higher spiral with the fruit of good and knowledge, uh, good and evil, knowledge of good and evil. We are called, this is what yoga is all about. Yoga is the arrival out of the ego through choice to the perfect condition of the Satya Yuga. So this is the Krita Yuga or the age of fulfillment rather than the Satya Yuga, which was the age of spontaneous um, manifestation of the divine.
תודה ששקלי, פליז אלבורט מור און קאלי אז דה דיוויין וויל. Yes, now this part of course when we are talking about these specific names, Sri Aurobindo uses them in his diary, but he does not use them in any of his public writings. That's why I said when he wrote Synthesis of Yoga, he didn't use either Krishna or Kali, he used Master of Works and the Divine Will. Because these names of the deities are always individual. It is, we discussed this a little bit this morning, According to the tantric idea, every individual is born from a deva and a devi. It is the notion of the ishta deva and the ishta devata, ishta deva and ishta devi. So in a sense, we are amshas or portions of some divine being. Some people are lucky from childhood. They have an attraction towards some particular kind of deity or some work or something like that. In the Gita, this is related to the Swabhava and Swadharma. The esoteric idea of the Swabhava and Swadharma is the connection with the Ishta Deva and Ishta Devi. So in Sri Aurobindo's case, also being from Bengal, where these two traditions are the most powerful, the traditions of Krishna and Kali, he, and, you know, he was very deeply influenced by Sri Ramakrishna. who was himself a bhakta of Kali. So this, these two become the central deities that are the power in his sadhana. But they need not be everybody's. So in that sense, I think we can say Krishna and Kali are a certain type of, uh, you know, divine couple uh, that meant uh, the divine Ishwara and Shakti for Sri Aurobindo. Each individual can have a different one or they can have no specific one. It can just be the divine Ishwara and the divine Shakti. In his case, it was these.